We've got the dollar firming up, yields higher, Bitcoin down. Obviously, we're thinking about Jackson Hole. Joining us, Lizanne Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Hey, Lizanne, good morning. Good morning, Oliver. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, seeing all the clips from Jackson Hole. Tiny bit jealous, but it's still Chicago summer, yeah. so uh, I'm happy where I am. Uh, what are you expecting here? Uh, you know, there, there's some thinking that they, they might take or Powell might take a more dovish tilt. I'm not sure I... I agree with that notion as it relates to the, you know, BLS benchmark revisions yesterday. That was expected for the most part. And when you have a Fed that expresses their data dependency on a regular basis and you still have a PCE report and a jobs report between now and the September meeting, it would seem odd if if he veered significantly more into the dovish camp and, you know, telegraph 50 versus 25. So our best guess is he's going to sort of Toe the recent party line, and uh, we're penciling in 25 when they start in September. Was there a uh, clear tone from the minutes yesterday? Did it seem like that was kind of the preamble to Jackson Hole, which is then like the prelude to September? Are we like stepping wise, uh, making our way to 25 basis points? Yeah, I mean, you 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 did had have a few members suggest that maybe starting to cut in July would have made sense, and there was a lot of chatter about that heading into the July meeting, not just in terms of Fed speakers, but uh, more broadly than that. So I think that's where we are in the cycle, where there we're not at that point of unanimity in terms of what's going to happen. We also have to remember that the September meeting we get an update to the summary of economic projections, we get an updated uh, dots plot. So that's one of those meetings that. Is, is in stark contrast to July, where you only rely on the decision and the, the commentary in the press conference. There's a lot more meat on the bone at this upcoming September meeting because of those, uh, those updates coming. Okay. Obviously, we like to get in the minutia of the language and uh, the kind of fine tuning of what they're thinking and how they're doing it. But I do feel, Lizanne, that at a certain uh, point, like we just kind of have to have the brass tax conversation, which is that there's so many indicators that are like late cycle, in cycle type of things that can these um, tweaks to policy turn those around? Uh, do we have the ability to kind of put that ship back in to the dock once it's left, like unemployment rising, SOM rule, all right. that stuff? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's the the ex expression of those that were been in the camp that the Fed is already behind the curve and will start easing uh, too late. It's the ultimate counterfactual. But you're you're right, particularly with with metrics like the unemployment rate. What what is interesting and and what I'll be paying close attention to when we get to the September FOMC meeting with the release of the updated SCP and, and DOTS is expectations around the unemployment rate because the June expectations suggested an unemployment rate just kind of hanging around in the low fours. And as, as you know, Oliver, once the unemployment rate inflects, which it has, um, you know, we're up almost a full percentage point from the low, it doesn't tend to stall and then bounce around. Once it inflects and starts to move higher, it tends to continue to move higher. Same thing happens in the opposite uh, direction. So I, I think the labor market really holds the, the key here. And even though we know the unemployment rate is a lagging indicator, given the huge um, uh, revisions that we have seen, not just with yesterday's BLS benchmark revision, but the significance of the downward revisions with each jobs report for the prior two months. We know it's a low response rate, the problems with the birth death assumption. I think the labor market becomes really important, but it's the innards of those reports. It's the differential between household employment and establishment employment, which generates uh, payrolls, it's hours worked, it's the wage data, it's long term unemployment. And I think it's the labor market side of the dual mandate that's in sharper focus right now, not just for the Fed, but investors. OK, uh, is it now like completely behind us, sort of the uh, inflation focus? It seems like the last couple months has done a pretty good job of reducing that threat significantly. Uh, and I guess we that's kind of the, the trade off, right? Is like, all right, now we have to worry about some of these labor data indicators, but at least we don't have to worry about this major reflation risk. Is that like formally kind of dead in your mind, Lizanne? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if the inflation data is in the rearview mirror, but I would I would put it in the uh, the windshield alongside the labor market data. You know, the the next release coming up is PCE, and you don't tend to get PCE reports that are well outside the band of consensus expectations because once you have CPI and PPI in hand, you can map those to PCE, and that's why you you don't tend to see a big uh, surprise on on that front. Uh, but I, I don't think inflation is yet in the rearview mirror. I just think it's being looked at equally alongside the other part of their mandate, which is the labor market. Okay. Uh, the thing that I've been thinking about, Lizanne, over the last two weeks, basically since we put in that uh, intraday low on August 5th, is that the market has looked pretty healthy for the most part. There's been generally high quality uh, leadership that's been up there. There's been some high beta stuff too. Uh, but we had yields of stocks up, which seemed like a nice normalization of that relationship, responding to good data. The last maybe three, four days, there's been a few sessions, including yesterday's, that looked a little bit frothier, a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more kind of like the market getting greedy about what the Fed might yeah. do. Well, give me the latest on what you're uh, seeing. So I, I think if you were going to put a uh, anything in the column on the risks side, especially given the sharp rally off the kind of intraday lows on on August fifth, it would be the sentiment environment. And and what we've seen in this very unique uh, cycle, especially this year, is when you go through a pullback phase, be it the recent one, be it the one that we saw in April, what you tend to see is a really shift, swift shift in attitudinal measures of sentiment, things like, you know, AAII, bulls versus bears, but you don't see the commensurate shift on the behavioral side, things like the put call ratio. And with that, that volatility surge in the early part of August, you saw the same thing happen. You saw a quick shift in attitudinal measures, but you didn't see that commensurate shift in the behavioral measures. And just as quickly, given the strength of the rally off those lows, we've seen both the attitudinal measures and and the behavioral measures show some level of, of froth. So that, that to me, if I were sort of ranking mm. risks on the other side of opportunities, the sentiment backdrop would be one of them. It's pretty amazing. So we like uh, had this massive like scare, almost panic, VIX 65, and then uh, obviously we came back down for vol in a hurry and the markets uh, come right back to where it was for the most part. I mean, there's still a lot of these companies that, uh, you know, kind of looked like it was healthy that they needed a little correction. And now we're like right back to where we were, like, uh, you know, some of the tech yeah, stuff. Yeah, you're still down a, a little bit in terms of, of, you know, mega cap segments inclusive of the, the MAG-7. And, okay. and, and maybe I'm stating the obvious here, but... I think, you know, in terms of, of next really, really important dates outside of broader macroeconomic numbers, Jackson Hole, um, inflation readings, the Fed meeting, of course, you've got NVIDIA's earnings. And, and, and as a proxy for that group, I think that's particularly important. I, I don't have an opinion on the, the, the likelihood that they be consensus expectations. As you know, that's not, that's not what I do at the individual stock level. But um, given valuation expansion there and this notion that we've got to see earnings continue to play catch up to valuations, and that being the poster child, uh, I'd add that to the mix of important dates to focus on. Mm, definitely. Uh, all right. I uh, think that's pretty much it. The last point that you guys have talked about uh, that's really important, Lizanne, is when we watch the Russell days like yesterday when it leads. Uh, to me, that's also kind of the representation of the frothier kind of days because there's a huge difference in performance within that sector between yep. like the low and the high quality, right? Oh, absolutely, and I—that's why we continue to use, you know, trader lingo. You want to, you want to fade the lower quality rallies within the Russell 2000. You want to lean into higher quality. Just as an example of that, over the past of the trailing one-year period, if you just break the Russell 2000 into zombies versus non-zombies, the non-zombies are outperforming to the tune of about 17 percentage points, up 15 for the non-zombies, down two for the, for the zombies. So uh, I think you still want to lean into the higher quality and avoid the lower quality. Wow, that's amazing. All right, uh, huge uh, 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 chasm uh, within that group. Uh, yep. All right, good stuff. Thank you very much, Lizanne. Thanks, Oliver. Lizanne Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab.